So I hate introductions. I got shell-shocked at an introduction in 1991. I've never gotten over it. Right after college, I was signed to a record label called Delicious Vinyl. Believe it or not, as a rapper, believe it or not, as a white rapper, and Delicious Vinyl had two other acts at the time. One was a guy named Tone Loke. You guys might know him. He wrote a song called Wild Thing and Funky Cold Medina. And the other was a guy who won a Grammy Young MC for a song called Bust a Move. I was the next artist on the label. One day I get a call from the owner of the, record, of the record company, and he said they're having this huge concert in Atlanta, Georgia, at the Georgia Dome. They're bringing in 30,000 inner city kids from all over Georgia to the Georgia Dome, and they're gonna have black artists and white artists in this Increase the Peace concert. And he calls me up and he says, guess what? He goes, Vanilla Ice is booked. I signed you up, you're the white act. So they hand me a plane ticket, I go to the arena, 30,000 inner city kids, I show up, and when I get there, I notice immediately like the place is incredibly unruly. Like there's fights in the stands, they're putting the house lights on, the police are there, and the kids are booing every single act that comes on stage, off the stage. So the first act up is LL Cool J in his prime. They boo LL Cool J off the stage. I'm sitting over here in the green room about to go on to sing my song that's not even out yet called Shake It Like a White Girl. <laughs> so I called my mother right away. I said, Mom, I got a really big problem and they're booing LL, I'm up next. She said, sweetie, just be yourself. Everything will be fine. It's not gonna be fine. They booed LL. So the announce, the MC comes up, he's like, ladies and gentlemen, all the way from California, IA, give it up for my main man, Jesse James. It's my stage name, don't Google it, definitely. I come out on stage and I can see the kids in the audience are like pissed off. They're like mad that I'm on stage. So the record label gave me a couple of t-shirts that I had. This section over here, you guys want some free t-shirts? They go bonkers. I throw them out. The section over here, you want some free t-shirts? I throw them out. Middle section, throw them out. I said, thank you very much. Salt and Pepper's up next. And I got the fuck out of there. <laughs> I'm still not over it. The theme today is creativity. When you get a 1,000 on your SAT, I probably got like a 980. I've convinced myself that I broke a 1,000. Creativity becomes a survival skill. It's a necessity to get into the door, to interview, to sell. Everything for me revolved around creativity. I want to spend a couple of minutes on my journey as an entrepreneur who is very non-traditional and give you some of my philosophies around the topic. So first of all, I went to American University in Washington, D.C. Really? What year? Oh, you're a puppy. Puppy. <laughs> 2000, I mean, I'm in the 90s, early, graduated in 90. The tuition at American, <laughs> the tuition at American University is $40,000 a year. When you went, it was probably like maybe more, who knows? 40,000, I think, when I went. For four years, $160,000, I can tell you guys, I learned and remember one thing. It's my $160,000 lesson. I was taking an advertising class. My senior year, I was at a crossroads. I was either gonna go into music or I was gonna sell a product called Aunt Franny's Brownies. My roommate in college, believe it or not, had an Aunt Franny that sent us brownies every month. I have no idea what she put in these brownies. They made me happy. And I'm like, I'm gonna sell these brownies after college, like that's what I'm gonna do if I don't go into music. So in this advertising class, for our final uh, exam, we had, we had to present a fictitious and create a fictitious brand. Ad campaign, slogan, packaging, the whole shebang. So I'm like, I'll use Aunt Franny's brownies, depending on my grade, if it's great and the professor loves it, like he's my R&D team, I'll sell the brownie. So I go in for, for, this, for the final exam and the way they, this class was structured is, everyone had to prepare this whole campaign, but he was gonna pick five people that had to present it orally. Now, there was 100 kids in the class, 5% chance, senior year, no one prepared for the oral presentation. So I come into the classroom and the professor says, all right, we're gonna do this the democratic way. Everybody put your name in a hat 
and I'm going to pick out the five names that are going to do the presentation. Sitting next to me in the class is this guy named Ronnie. We'll call him Ronnie. Ronnie was a jack jerk, an asshole. Ronnie hazed me and bullied me for four years of college. So I took 20 pieces of paper, and I wrote Ronnie, and stuffed him into the hat. <laughs> professor takes the hat, professor takes the hat, opens up the thing, picks out the first name. Sure enough, the first name that comes up, Jesse Itzler. This jackass did the same thing, true story. <laughs> so I go up there to pitch Aunt Franny's brownies, and halfway, 30 seconds into my pitch, the professor says, stop, southern guy. He says, son, I want to know what is your point of differentiation. I said, that's easy. I'm a brownie. I'm home-baked. I'm moist. I could be gluten-free if you want me to be gluten-free. He says, no. He says, don't you get it? There's a thousand brownies out there. Substitute brownie for widget, whatever you want to be. There's a thousand products, but a thousand brownies. You want to come out with a brownie? You got to really stand out or you're going to sit on the shelf with the other thousand of just brownies. Sit down, son. Sit down in my chair. And I said to myself, I'm going into music because it's just vanilla ice and I could be a brownie. <laughs> so one day at the recording studio, I walk in and there's a cassette sitting on the music board. And it's the cassette that changed my life. The cassette was by an artist, a rap pioneer named Dana Dane. Dana was a Brooklyn-born artist. His first album was one of my favorite albums. And this was an advanced copy in the late 80s that nobody, or nobody had sitting there. I wanted to listen to it. So I asked the engineer if I could borrow the cassette. And I would bring the cassette back after I listened to it. He says, sure. A couple of days later, I'm on my way to Los Angeles to visit a friend. I'm listening to it in my Sony Walkman, if anyone remembers those. Sony Walkman, yeah. And when I'm on the plane, I read that the owner of Delicious Vinyl's favorite artist, this is a big label, Tone Loke and Young, his favorite artist is Dana Dane. So when I land in California, I cold called Delicious Vinyl. I get all the way up to the assistant of this guy. She has no idea what I'm talking about. I'm talking very fast like a New Yorker. I have Dana's tape. I know Mike's a fan of Dana. Dana blah, 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 blah. She puts me on hold. She comes back two minutes later and she says, Dana, if you can be here at 2 o'clock, Mike Ross would love to meet you. Dana will be there at 2 o'clock. <laughs> 2 o'clock comes. Now, Dana's a Brooklyn-born guy, like I said, African-American, gold tooth. Not me. I pushed the, now a good friend of mine, though. Push the button. They said, uh, I said, hey, I'm Dana here from Mike Ross. Oh, Mike is expecting you. Dana, come right in. I walk in. They escort me into the office. Loke's record, Young's record, he's got this funky candle going, they sit me down. I'm sitting there, I'm waiting, no idea what's going to happen. In walks Mike Ross and says to me, not as politely, who in the world are you? There's a famous quote by Harry Truman. If you can't convince them, confuse them. It works so far. So I start saying, oh, I work at the same studio as Dana, I know you're a fan of Dana, he must be late. He has an advanced tape, blah, 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 blah. Can I put in my cassette that I did at Dana's studio? You have a cassette? What do you do? I rap. Huh? Put it in. Put in my cassette, and he says the four words that every artist, struggling artist, wants to hear. Who's your lawyer? I don't have a lawyer. I have a dad. So I give him my dad's number. My dad owns a plumbing, <laughs> my dad owns a plumbing supply house in Mineola. I call my father when we leave. I said, Dad, I think I just got a record deal. If someone calls you, we got our foot in the door, we're going to figure the rest out later. Get all the documents. That started a journey of getting my foot in the door and figuring it out later. A key thing in creativity, starting the process, trusting the process, and letting it evolve. Because if you don't get your foot in the door, if you don't start, Nothing happens. I did it with a company called Marquee Jet. We sold it to Warren Buffett. I did it with our company, Zico Coconut Water. We sold it to Coca-Cola. I'm now one of the co-founders. Of, of, I'm a part owner of the Atlanta Hawks. And my business career went full circle back to music, most recently, when I was at a dinner party. And the host of the party said to all the 12 couples there, name three people that you would want to have dinner with that are alive. It's a great question. And we got a lot of the obvious ones. Oprah, the president, Gates, Matt Damon. But when it came to me, 
All three of mine were rappers. I'll tell you why. Because these three guys changed the trajectory of my life when I was a teenager, and I wanted to meet them. I wanted to meet them. I wanted to know what caused them to write the songs and what was in their heart. So after the dinner, I decided to invite the 10 most influential people in, in music to my house for dinner. I knew two of them, and they all came. And the takeaway for me, the connectivity between what these guys did in their creative world and as entrepreneurs and in my journey was this. These guys had no prior experience, neither did I, in anything that they did. In the music business, I had no prior experience in Marky Jet or Zico or anything that I did. And for a lot of people, that's a deterrent. Ah, I got a dream. I want to open a restaurant. I want to start an apparel company. I want to go run a marathon, whatever it is. I can't do that. I have no background in being a restaurateur or an apparel. And they don't do it out of fear. But it's actually the biggest blessing. Because it guaranteed us, with no prior experience, that we would do things differently. That we would be a brownie. Because no one taught us how to do it. I always say to my employees, if no one taught you how to do your job, how would you do it? And it's amazing how many creative ideas come from that. Instead of being told over and over, this is how you sell. This is how you pitch. Forget that. How would you do it? Not everybody has the same skill set. How would you do it if nobody taught you how to do it? The second thing is these guys, these artists were young. They had no time to be scared. They had no time to be scared. Now, fear is a really powerful thing. But when you surrender and say, I'm not scared of fear, it's unbelievably liberating. Now, I don't like to be embarrassed, but I'm not scared of it. But it wasn't always like that for me. When I was a senior in uh, college, there was a girl that I liked. I had to have my roommate in college call her up and ask her to go to the formal as me. I he literally called up and said, hey, this is Jesse. That fast forward 20 years. I like this girl. I'm trying to court her. She's the founder of Spanx. I call the phone. I call the, her assistant at Spanx. And I'm, this is the same time that I'm about to run a 100-mile race nonstop in 24 hours for charity. I call up. I get to the assistant. And I said, um, can you tell Sarah that I would love to wear Spanx if, in this 100-mile race if she would give me a testimonial for my website? I don't want a testimonial. I want a Sarah. <laughs> Obviously. The assistant goes, hold on one second. Puts me on hold and says, Sarah. There's some lunatic on the phone that wants to run 100 miles in Spanx. She says, I think I might know that lunatic. And a year later, she married the lunatic. But in between that time when my roommate had a call to ask this girl for a date to when I got Sarah, I call it like the lamb mentality and the lion mentality, there was a lot of self-doubt. And self-doubt is probably the biggest enemy to creativity. And the way you conquer self-doubt is by doing things that make you uncomfortable. I want to share this story with you guys. A couple of years ago, I'm at a race in San Diego. It's a 24-hour relay race. The format of the race is you run a mile, you run a mile, you run a mile, I run a mile. Whatever team runs the most amount of miles in 24 hours wins the race. There's a guy sitting to my left. I'm with five friends that did this for fun. There's a guy sitting to my left who has nobody to relay with. He's his own relay team. And the race is self-supported. It was on a one-mile dirt, unlit parking lot in San Diego. You had to bring all your own supplies. They don't even provide water. I had just sold Marquee Jet to Buffett. I overdid our supplies. I had a truck pull up with like a whole food truck with like bananas in case like we were on it. Like Gilligan's Island. I had a tent, masseuses. This guy, he had three items. He had a fold up chair, one bottle of water, and a box of crackers. That's it. And he was about 285 pounds. And I'm thinking to myself, how in the world is this guy gonna run with those supplies and that much weight for 24 hours? And sure enough, at mile 70, he sits down in his fold-up chair. And because he weighed so much, and from all the pounding, 
he literally broke all the small bones in both of his feet, crushed. Excuse me, but because he had no nutrition, ate crackers and water, he had kidney failure, and he was peeing blood. My first reaction immediately is like, we got to get this guy a medic immediately. We got to get him out of here immediately. What does this guy do? He takes duct tape, duct tapes his feet, gets out of the chair, runs 30 miles to get to his goal, and then runs one more mile in case they miscounted. I got to meet this guy. Because I got to meet this guy because I have to know whatever got him out of that chair, whatever that drive was, if I could learn that and teach that to my family, my employees, me, all the buckets in my life would be so much better. My work life, my personal life, my relationship with my kids, everything. So I, I Google him after the race, and I learn he's a Navy SEAL with an amazing backstory. I cold call him. I, flo I fly out to meet him. He says he'll give me 15 minutes to the minute. I fly out there, and I'm sitting with him, and I realize that I'm not going to get what I, whatever he has, and I don't even know what he has at the time, talking to him. So I ask him if he'll come live with me and my family for 31 days. He looks at me and he says, if you're crazy enough to ask a guy like me to come live with you, I'm crazy enough to come. Three days later, he's at my breakfast table. So he puts me through... Imagine telling that to your wife, by the way. I've, we're having a guest. He likes duct tape. When he comes into my house, I'm in a good place in my life. Still am. Married, still am. One child, now I have four. But like so many of us in the room, I was in a routine. And routines are great, but routines can also be a rut. They're too comfortable. My routine, probably similar to a lot of you guys. Get up in the morning, work out, go to work, have dinner with my family, spend some time with my wife, repeat every day. And I was operating at a high level, but I wasn't getting better. So I needed something to shake it up. You can't be creative in a creative world when you're doing the same thing over and over every day. And that's what I was doing. I had to get out of it. So he comes to my house, and he puts me through a series of very unorthodox things. So one of the things that he did is one day when I lived on a lake, the lake was frozen. Kids are playing hockey. After a run, he goes, he takes a boulder. He starts banging a hole in the middle of the lake until he gets a little hole, puts his hands like this, jumps into the water, and then goes like this. I'm not going in the cold water. My mother, I remember specifically growing up in Long Island, telling me in the winter, don't go anywhere near frozen ice. He's bathing in it, like rubber ducky, playing, splashing, going like this. Gave me the look, take my clothes off, I jump into the water. I'm about to get out of the water. He says, no, you can't get out of the water. If your skin touches the ice, you'll stick to it like the kid in Christmas story, his tongue. So I slide my hands into my, into my shoes. I crawl out. He says, all right, we got like three minutes to get to the house. You're going to get frostbite or hypothermia. I sprint up to the, height, to the house. I'm running up out of the ice. I'm freezing, and I see my wife looking out the window. <laughs> she comes. She's livid. She comes in, and she says to the Navy SEAL, what's the medical benefit of jumping into frozen water? And he says, it's all about getting comfortable being uncomfortable. That is what breaks apart the self-doubt. That is what gives you freedom. That is what makes you feel most alive. That is where the heart of creativity comes from. So I decided that I was gonna take a bucket list, which was for me having dinner with my 10 favorite artists and flip it upside down and replace the B with an F. So I created a bucket list and I encourage everybody here to have an bucket list and those are things that make you feel uncomfortable, things you might fail at, things that stink, things that require preparation, but those are the things that make you most alive, and those are the things where you get the most lessons from, and those are the things that conquer self-doubt and fear. The other thing I would say as it relates to creativity is you have to avoid clutter. 
We live in a world where we almost lose control of all of our time. Every day we have arrows that, I call them arrows, that come at us. Hey, Jesse, can you spend 15 minutes with this guy? He wants to pick your brain on coconut water. And hey, can you pay this guy? This guy wants to borrow $50 and this email needs to be returned. Like constantly dodging all this stuff. And we feel obligated to say yes because we don't want to feel, you know, let anyone down. And we lose control of our time. How could you be productive, have a vibrant life, be successful if someone else controls all your time or you're filled with clutter? So I did a very simple thing. We can all do it. I drew a pie chart, okay? I said there's 24 hours in the day. I sleep seven of them. That leaves 17 hours in the day. I take three of them for me. And those three hours could do anything that I want. It could be I'm going for a run, a steam. I'm doing nothing. I'm doing my emails. I'm reading. But I don't want to resent my wife. I don't want to resent my boss. I don't resent my partner for taking away the things in my life that I love to do by controlling my time. Three hours for me. The average American works a 40-hour work week. That's eight hours a day. Seven for sleep. Three for yourself. Eight for work. Guess what? You got six hours left in the day. All the clutter's gone. Now, of course, you have to commute. You have dinner. You have family. You have meals. The point is you can be incredibly productive, incredibly creative, incredibly free when you take control of your time. When you figure out how you want to attack your time over the course of a week. I'm going to leave you guys with, with this one thought. I have a saying I think to myself every day. It's that I didn't come this far to only come this far. Creativity has no limits. We're not like a limited amount that we're going to use up. When you do something, you check the box and move on. Do the next thing. We don't live in the past. Create a life resume. Do as many things that you can do that you want to do and check the box and do the next thing. Declutter. Let's get after it.